of migration. A crisis has developed in Europe, but the treatment of foreigners is something all nations need to explore, especially given our own recent tensions. Today, record numbers of migrants stream through the Balkans into Hungary, forcing Austria to suspend trains travelling to it from Hungary. Many are fleeing a war and poverty in Syria, Afghanistan or Pakistan and are hoping to reach Germany that's shown its willingness to nationalise migrants. Frontline states, including Hungary, Greece and Italy, are bearing the brunt of the refugee crisis. Yesterday, the European Commission unveiled a plan for the EU to share out 160,000 refugees to help ease the burden of those states. But it's a drop in the ocean and Germany wants a more permanent solution as hundreds of thousands of migrants are expected to arrive. It wants proportional distribution or quota commitments with no limit on numbers. Eastern European nations such as the Czech Republic, Poland and Slovakia of Yemen opposed to that plan and the divided nations will be meeting on the crisis tomorrow. Well, to discuss, uh, we're now joined by MTS uh, Suleiman from Gift of the Givers, a humanitarian organization working in the very conditions in Syria and other countries that have led to this crisis. So I'm very glad you can join us uh, this evening, MTS. Thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure. Thank you. So, so you've been looking for safer medical facilities in, in Syria. Just explain uh, those conditions on the ground that, that have led to this. Syria is a living hell, to put it simply. There is no such thing as a safe place in Syria, although me and my office staff in Syria talk about safe places. There's bombing everywhere in the country. And every time if there's some kind of success by rebel fighters, the bombing becomes very, very intense. Mm. And all types of weapons are used. If the hospital that we set up in January 2013 can speak, it will tell you of the horrors it has seen. The migration that you see in Europe, as you know, is manifestation of a greater catastrophe inside Syria, which the world is not following. The world has suddenly woke up to the crisis in Syria when all the refugees came to Europe. But for the last four years, hospitals, clinics, medical centers, ambulances, medical personnel have been targeted. Physicians for Human Rights in America did research earlier in the year, and they documented already 700 medical personnel directly targeted and killed. Sure. In, in northern Syria, where we are in Idlib region, we, my hospital manager got saved by 20 minutes. As he went to meet the doctors, the bombs fell and flattened two hospitals in the city. And all that bulk of patients are now coming to our hospital. And to answer your question at the beginning, our hospital has been the center of target for, from, from the time of inception. It survived many attacks on a few occasions. Are hospitals actively targeted or, or is it just in the, in the fray, basically? No, no, it's part of the, the plan. It's an active plan to bomb the hospitals. And that's why the medical staff in our hospitals have come from hospitals that were bombed in other parts of Syria. And they all give you the same story. The planes came deliberately targeting us and witnesses from the ground watch it. Because, I mean, the military knows the coordinates of every part of the country. Mm -hmm. Obviously, they know where the hospitals are, to, not to miss it or, or, you know, to avoid hitting it if they don't want to hit it. So it's a deliberate bombing. And because of that, and the number of patients multiplying in the hospital, in our first hospital, we then needed to move into a second hospital in a safer area. And we say safer because it's relative, it's closer to the Turkish border. And the jets don't come so close to the Turkish border, although incidents have happened where bombing has taken place in the border and across the border. Mm. So, so uh, I saw a quote, uh, somebody saying, Syria is inhabitable. So, so all these refugees uh, need, need a place to live. They, they should be welcomed by other countries. Well, there's two sides to the story. One is, yes, they need to be welcomed by other countries. But you're having a mass movement of people moving away from the home of their birth, where their great-grandparents, parents and everybody have been there for years. You're bottoming out a country. Yes, there's, there's 14 million people on the move, inside and outside Syria, in a country of 21 million people. But we need, the world needs to really look at the situation. Yes, you can take the refugees into Europe, but why not do what was done in Europe in 92 to 95, in the Balkans where they're coming through now, you know, in, in Bosnia and Serbia and Croatia. Safe havens were created within the country. Why can that not be implemented? It's much cheaper. It mm -hmm. keeps people in their own country. It limits movement across borders. People ca have access to food, water, and medical care. And they have to learn from the lessons of, of Bosnia and make sure that the, the safe havens are not overrun like what happened in Srebrenica. And it can be done. They have the, they have the, the military power. 
they have the, the world and they can do that. Is, is it viable because you say they're, they're jets uh, bombing everywhere, targeting hospitals? I guess if you've got the military might, you can zone off, off certain areas. Well, they did the same thing. NATO told uh, Serbia that if you bomb safe havens, we'll bomb you back. You know, it's, mm. it's, it's a force. It's a, it's a, uh, the, uh, threat, the use of, of, of threat as a force, but you don't actually use the force. Just say, you know, we can use it if you want to, but we don't want to use it. We don't want to see any more loss of life. Yeah. We don't want to see any further development of the conflict. We want to see the end, because it's, uh, one more life loss is a life loss too much. And people, I mean, inside Syria, you see it. They come to your hospital. They, they, they're anxious. they tense. They're traumatized. The kids don't know what's going on. They're hungry. At one point, they're eating cats. They're eating rats. They're eating grass. There's no water. Mm. They go and live on the banks of the river. And I tell my teams, why are you putting them on the banks of the river? When winter comes, that river is going to swell, swell, uh, swell. They're going to move again. He said, my friend, find me a place. Where must I put them? They, it's, there's no safe place in Syria. For now, they'll have to stay on the banks of the river. When the water comes, we'll worry about the movement then. But for now, we can't do anything. Mm. And there's m migration all the time. Kids never know when they're going to move next. I met an old lady in a school. She said, look, I'm staying in the school, but I know I'm going to die. Because Assad's forces know where the school is. They're going to bomb it soon and we're going to die. But I'm tired of running. It's, it's just mind-boggling. It's, it's just crazy. If, if we move to Europe now, so, so the fact is these people are on the move. There's some taking this incredibly treacherous journey. But then we have these frontline states, so Hungary, Greece, um, accepting a lot of the refugees. They're feeling burdened. Germany says the, the, uh, there should be a quota system. It should be shared out. What do you think about the, uh, not the economics, the, the the human element of, of the way this is being treated and should be treated? Look, the response is, is reasonably good. I would say, given the crisis in Europe, what the bailout required for Greece, the economy suffering, Spain, Portugal, Ireland, you know, Greece all had problems in, in Europe, and finances, the cash is not there as it was before. And in times of old, Europe has supported refugee situations throughout the world. And there's two issues here. One is the government and one is the people. Germany has set an example. Both the government and the people said, yes, welcome, come to the country. It all depends on who has economy. Because Greece has, is battling to meet the, the, the bailout. They need a bailout. And now you're going to have these refugees burdening them. It's a very tragic situation. I'm not saying they must not accept refugees. But you understand their situation. They have problems from their own population, where austerity measures have to be taken. And they have, they have going to have revolt in their own country from their own people. Are they going to deal with the revolt from the people? Or are they going to deal with the refugees? Mm. So if richer countries, Britain, Australia, Germany can take more refugees in, and, and as the Pope said, please take them in your homes. Once you take them in your homes, homes, and the civilians and the residential population comes in and say, okay, we will take them. The burden is taken away from the government. I don't know if the government says, okay, I'll pay you a thousand euros or something for keeping them in your house. I don't know. But if families take them, it takes the burden off the states. And if that can be done in Europe by more affluent people, it will help mm -hmm. relieve the burden on the governments. The, the problem, however, is... Uh and I, I'm so interested in the change of heart that's happened after the publication of a picture of a dead little boy, which the media is, is cautious about and should be. But an incredible uh, change, it, it seems, in public sentiment. So, so like you say, people saying, come into our homes. But what in years to come, when, when maybe the costs are rising, maybe there's a bit of social unrest, uh, division, new communities rising up, uh, do you think this goodwill can, can last? depends on circumstances in the country. If the economy is get bad, it is job losses, it is unemployment, if the Chinese fallout causes a big problem, you know, and shares and stock markets collapse, and you find the world economies are, if we go back to 2008, it's going to be a serious crisis. People will want to take care of the refugees, but they'll find the stress of looking after them is going to become a problem. So mm -hmm. there's not a permanent solution. The solution really, they have to go back home. And the only way to do that is to stop the war in Syria. And if you ask any refugee from anywhere in the world, his country, if his country is stable, he wants to go back home. Mm. So, so your hope, I guess, is that the world will focus on Syria and deal with Syria. That, that's what you're saying. That's yes. what we have to do. I'm saying use Europe, what has happened in Europe, as a door to go back to Syria. Don't say everybody come out of Syria and go to Europe. Mm. That's wrong. Use this as a means of educating the world and say, you know what, we're running away from the crisis that's taking place there. We need to refocus and get back inside there and stop this. 
because of course uh, Germany saying we will accept uh, refugees from Syria again could encourage a huge outflux. Um, I was interested today uh, an NGO calling itself uh, Air Refugees I, I think is saying why should we make the ensure that the way is perilous why can't we set up an chartered uh, flight because you won't get on a commercial flight and help Syrians to move out. But again, then you have the problem of, of a country being decimated and, and failing to recover in the long run. No, we're not, we're not solving the problem. We just want to encourage more and more people to leave. It's going to encourage further fighting in the country. It's going to say the world is looking the other way whilst we're bombing and killing. It's giving the wrong message. You're giving a totally wrong message to us and its forces. You have to send the world into Syria and use, use the UN. Why is it that this country, I mean, this is the first country in a war situation. I don't see media in the country. When I walked into Syria, I asked, have I come to the right place? They mm -hmm. said, what do you mean? I said, when you walked into Bosnia, you saw all the satellite dishes, the vans, the UN, every type of aid agency in the world in the middle of a war zone. You will have to dig for them to find them inside Syria. Mm -hmm. They're not there. It's like a silent war. Journalists have been killed, and it, it's, it's scary, I guess, as well. Journalists have been killed in every other war, too. Mm. Journalists love stories. They go into war zones. They're not afraid to go into war zones. They, they look for that kind of stories. For some reason, the world has moved away from Syria, and it's, it's a silent war. Yeah. There's a final thing if we, if we talk about the economics, and I don't know if, because I guess you're always in the battle rather than in the aftermath, uh, but there is a theory that, that migrants in the end help create vibrancy, uh, vibrancy in the, in the economy. They are people who are very resilient. Uh, I saw a Western German town say, come, we're stagnating and, and we're old and, and tired. We need uh, young people. Steve Jobs, the, the son of Syrian migrants, uh, do you see that, I guess, that, that human spirit? Yes, that can happen. It depends on the type of skills the migrants bring with them. If they bring, bring screams, they can benefit the economy. Yes, they will benefit the economy. But what millions of people coming out, everybody doesn't have that skill. Mm. Many of them are women and children, which then becomes, a, you know, like a burden, for a, a burden, better word, yeah. on, on people. And then I'm, I'm afraid it may turn around and people may get angry, as we spoke about earlier. All right, we'll, we'll have to follow this dire situation. Thank you uh, for your insight. Uh, that was Imtiaz Suleiman from Gift of the Given.